Let's talk about interviewing. Interviewing. Yeah. So Emily Gosselin asks, what are some good questions to be asking IA firms when interviewing with them? Which I think is a great question. So if you're going to go, like say, for example, you're going to go to NACA and you're going to have the opportunity to interview with 30 or 40 um, different IA firms over three days, Mm -hmm. January 10th through the 14th or 13th, the 14th being an NFIP certification. And we'll be there. We will be there. Absolutely. Well, we will have been there. We will already have been there by the time this, this goes off. So, so if you have an opportunity to sit down for 15 minutes with an HR director, possibly a CEO, an operations manager, a team manager, a field manager, whoever is going to be there, recruiter, um, how do you maximize your time sitting in front of those people? So what kind of questions? Because they're going to ask you, do you have any questions for me? You better have some questions for them, right? Thoughts? So, yeah, um, first come to my mind would be to ask them, do they like loggers or ales? Okay, good question. That would be, icebreaker. Yeah. yeah. So that'd tell you a lot about a man by, yeah. or a woman, by which they prefer. Do you like your white wine with ice in it? Ice cubes? One or more. I will definitely tell you. I'll tell you something about a little that. about their background. So, um, I think you know. First question would be, where do you see me in ten years? I mean, um, no, <laughs> really, it would be it, what? Nothing. Okay. I'm just looking at you. It would be uh, for me. It would really be about. You know, kind of, I would be asking kind of about their culture. For me, that's very important about the companies I work with, you know, um, such as do we have a point of single point of contract or do we just call into a general number? Um, you know, things like, to me, that's, again, what's important to me isn't important to everybody, you know. Right. That, that's something that's important to me, but at the same time, I'd be asking them, you know, hey, what type of work do you, I mean, if you're looking for dailies, you know, what type of work do you have in my area? Do you primarily do this? Who are some of the carriers that you work with? You know, um, like, you know, there's, there's one particular carrier that I just absolutely will not work for. Okay. And I'm not going to go into who that is here. And, um, but you know, who's your primary clients? You know, I mean, are you, are you working for these particular companies? And, and then, once they tell you that, say, you know, okay, I've got experience with these companies or I would like to do this, you know, does that fit in with you? You know, and, you know, it would really be more, are you a fit? Are they a fit for you and are they, you know, and vice versa? Are you a fit? Are they a fit? You know, where does this come from? And let them know, and through your questioning, let them know what you're willing to do. You know, don't come in there and say, I'm not going to do this. Focus right. on more questions when you're asking them questions it's kind of leading down the path of the things that you're willing to do for them, not the things you're not willing to do. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And it's all how you frame the questions, um, such as, so do you, do you guys just do cat or do you do daily as well? Okay. Um, do you do flood? Do you, I mean, ask those questions and say, because this is an area that I would like to go into. You know, and they're like, oh, yeah, we don't do that or well, we're looking at doing this. And, and it just kind of helps you go down that path. For me, there's really no no big question for me when it comes to talking to an IA firm. I mean, it, it, we discussed it yesterday. I don't want to steal your thunder where you something you might say. But it really is about what you can do for them. You know, it's what your capability. I mean, you want to f- seek out the – you want to ask questions that lead to you showcasing your abilities for them. Okay, not, you know, well, what's your pay structure? Don't let that be your first question. Or what are your paydays? Um, you know, yeah. do you have benefits? You know, because, yeah. A, you're independent, and if they happen to have some, you're going to get lucky anyway. Um, not unless you're getting hired as an employee full-time. But if you're just going as an IA, then there's no benefits. So a, a lot of your standard questions you would ask at a job interview are just kind of out the window interviewing as an IA. Kind of, yeah. You know, so. they're, just, they're just gone. So again, you're just trying to showcase your talents as you're going through that interview, what your capabilities are. Yeah. You know, do you do just tall and steep? Because I actually am um, rope and harness certified, you know, yeah. things like that's how I would, 
would question something like that. Yeah. And yeah. I would say to go even farther, you know, again, we kind of talk about how you can help them, mm-hmm. right? What What is it that I'm going to be able to do for your company that will keep your phone from ringing is like the kind of mindset. Right. <clears throat> when you ask questions like that, it also gives them a, an opportunity to kind of like toot their own horn and talk about themselves a little bit. Mm-hmm. You always, it's just like any other kind of conversation with people where you're trying to like develop rapport. You want to talk about what they're interested in, right? And in, in a way, mm-hmm. um, so a, a part of the questions, I mean, not all of them, but I, I would say what you would want to throw in there would be things that will, um, things, you know, find out where their strengths are. So like, in other words, like, it, are, at your eye firm, do you guys primarily do daily or do you do cats and what opportunities do you have? You know, what help there, what help do you need in those areas? Mm-hmm. Right. You know, if I'm willing to travel to help you do daily claims outside of my state or outside of my region or whatever, is there an opportunity for me to do that? You know, that's a great question because they oh, yeah. say, well, my, we're looking for people in Montana for, to do anything up there. Cause and you'll find out that they are because there's nobody's here. Um, things like that where you're you're automatic, you're already showing initiative and willingness to do things above and beyond what the the guy who is just sitting here before you and the, and the person sitting here, what's going to be sitting here right after you, mm-hmm. you're willing to be the yes person, right? Which and when you, especially when you're starting out, you kind of have to be that person. I think when when people start getting experience and they start getting you, you know deployments and storms and years under their belts they start to kind of, this starts to make sense to them. Mm -hmm. They know that if they can, if they can help out site management, you know, or help out the team in some way that they're going to be, they're going to have more opportunities. Right. And there's that reciprocity thing that we talk about. Um, I would want to know from my perspective, um, what does your company do to help to streamline the process, the claims handling process for adjusters is, you know, it's kind of of hard to to know exactly how to frame that question, but it's something that's important to me because I want to know that if I show up and I have to do 59 steps in order to close a claim, I'm not going to be like delighted. It's, you know, it's not going to be like Mm -hmm. something that's going to make a pleasurable working experience for me. If, if they have a a super simple process with a lot of support, then, you know, then they're, they're, they're focusing on helping the adjuster help them back. Right. Right. So the the more streamlined their process is to, to a point, you know, there's a, there's diminishing returns. Um, I think the better, a lot of carriers have a lot of compliance stuff. They got a lot of forms and things they want everybody to fill out. If, if the IA firm can figure out how to make it easy for the adjuster to accomplish those tasks, then I think they're going to have, I mean, just in, just in general, I mean, this mm-hmm. is just a general statement. They're going to find that I think that they get a better work product out of, out of everybody if they make it easy. You know, it's like if you want to buy something online and they, they accept check or money order, you know. Right. They're not making it easy for you to pay to be a customer, to buy from them, right? So, but if they have a, two clicks and they've already got your credit card, then, you know what I mean? So that's a streamlined process. It's not, well, I got to go down to, because I don't, I don't know where my, I haven't seen my checkbook since 2002. I got to go down to Western Union and get a money order, go to my bank and then get a thing and then go find an envelope somewhere. And what, a stamp? I mean, who even does that stuff anymore unless you're mailing Christmas cards, right? So a lot of, I feel like, I'm totally going on. Just don't say, ask any of these things. <laughs> when you're in an interview, I'm going off the rails here a little right. bit. But I think it's important. I think it's, you know, when the, the, the carriers and firms have a clunky process that's like has a bunch of extra steps in it for things that all we're trying to do is we look at something, we take pictures of it, we write an estimate and give somebody a check or, or pay them money to fix it. That's it. It shouldn't be 71 steps or 129 step, whatever it is, right. to do an insurance claim. You know what I'm saying? So it's. That's that's important to me on the claims handling side. I want to know that that the company is modern, that they're that they're either developing their own technology. Some IA firms do; they have their own apps for things, um, or that they're at least using like modern tools. And a lot of times, you can go to their website and take a look. And yeah, see. you know, some of that software being written by some of these companies are actually being written by people who have never run a claim before. That is also a fact, and that's a problem too. 
that's a that's that's a problem whether it's 2020 or 1920 because <sighs> the systems that they set up for claims handling are a lot of times put together by people who've never run claims yeah. before right yeah it's just whether it's a modern app and software or it's just like some like paper system so that's that's a story as old as time. I yes, think. it is. And it's, we know about it, so there's no reason why we need to keep doing it. You know? know. And even... Like, and, and, that, and that just goes to another question. What CMS do you use? You know, what claims management right. software do you, system do you have that is in place? Because if you've got experience of one that you're really, really good at, you know, and you find out, hey, they, they use that one, you know, then you have a chance to showcase that talent. I use that all the time. It's one of my favorites. You yeah. know, this is what I like about that software. You know, this, you know, this is why I like using it. You know, like, oh, wow, somebody that understands it. I will tell you that there's one company, the reason why they use me is because the software they use, I understand it really, really well. Okay. And, and they're amazed that I can navigate their software when they have so many other people that can't. And that's why I get so much more business out of them, you know, because I love that software that they use, you know, and yeah. it's my favorite one to use. And then there's two companies I work with that they've written their own software and one of them, I will not do claims for it because their software is so bad. Yeah, there's a little bit of that. I and just I, stopped. This is, I mean, this, I mean, you could, there's a lot of places we can go with this question. And I think, you know, another thing that I would tell you to do absolutely um, is to go ahead and visit their website. You know, yep. you've got an appointment at 1015. Take yep. five minutes beforehand. Um, take a look at their website. Go to their About Us and look and see. They'll tell you what the things that are important to them, right? So, you know, every year company X gives X number of dollar percentage to this charity, right? If that's important to you, then you can bring that up. You know, I saw that you guys, you know, you're very, you're very active in giving to this particular wounded warrior project or whatever it is. Um, I am also, you know, very active with those guys in a local chapter and, da, 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 and you can, you, it's, it's a rapport building thing right there. Um, Are you an insurance adjuster? Then you need insurance adjuster. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. I really think you should get both of them. It doesn't matter if you're W-2 or 1099 or work carrier direct. Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the Insurance for Adjusters free guide, go to cplic.net slash adjustertv. They want to know, I, 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 I know recruiters and, and people, and people who are in hiring roles. And I find that they will often tell me that the number one thing that would help somebody get through an interview better is to just go to the, the company's website and just look at it for five minutes yep. and just see what they're all about. You know? So back when I was in the hot seat hiring people, I used to do that all the time. So tell me what you know about us. Yeah, exactly. And you would be amazed of the low percentage of people who actually went to our website or knew anything about us before they walked in that door. Yep. Only thing they saw was, hey, there's a job opening, okay, and I got a resume, and I think I can do that job, so I'm going to go interview with them, and I'm going to yeah. go waste this guy's time because I'm not prepared for this interview. Yeah. Preparing for the interview is, you know, is, is as much about, you know. Knowing who you're interviewing with. Exactly. Uh, as much as preparing yourself and yeah. what, you know, we all want to talk about ourselves. We do. Know? And so do they. So, so let them talk about themselves. Yeah. You know, um, I don't really have much on that topic because I'm a horrible interviewer, <laughs> interviewee. I was like, you got work. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take, I'll show up. You give me the money. I'll do it. You no, know, for how much? No, I'm not doing it. Never mind. Um, but I, I think it's, <laughs> and, and you know, Obviously, we're past NACA now, um, but NACA 2022, this is, again, I mean, what, uh, at almost any price, almost, what more valuable uh, opportunity is there than to, to have a, a great big gigantic room filled with every single company that you would ever possibly want to work for, all wanting to t interview you okay, it was the greatest thing i could have ever done last year yeah i mean <laughs> i mean how many contacts and how many jobs did you get out of that some people w leave that, that, that convention with claims in hand i know yeah and i didn't really focus on a lot of that when i first got back i had other things going on 
But as the year progressed, the phone calls I received, the contacts I made, just following up with people, you know, um, connecting with those people on LinkedIn, you know, yeah, it, it opened up so many doors for me, you know, and, you know, hey, I met you at NACA, you know, hey, I remember you. And it's just, it was fun, you know, I had a blast doing it and, and getting those interviews and making those friends. And some of those people have already left and gone to other companies. That's right. You know, That's so right. you met them. So let's say that there was a company that you thought, well, I'd like to work with them and they've never called you. Now, all of a sudden, somebody that you met at NACA has now shifted working for somebody else and you have that contact and you reach out to them. Now you just got your end of that company, you know, yeah, worked out great. That's a totally another subject we could talk about networking and back and, Let's do it. and everything else. But. Because I, I, in my career, I've had that happen a few times. Um, I had a manager for a, a cat. It was my first hurricane, Hurricane Ivan back in 04. And my manager, it was, I was actually running claims for Liberty Mutual which back then was a super easy gig because all you had to do was, it was easy. Um, but my, my manager at the time, um, I guess I impressed him a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was a super cool guy and we kind of hit it off a little bit. He reached out to me several years later. I want to say, Oh, almost 10 years later and said, Hey, um, he's a, he was an executive, he was an executive at another IA firm. He like moved up and kind of bounced around a little bit and ended up being like in the leadership team at this other IA firm. And he wanted to get me on the roster. And so I went and ran claims for them for a little while. And then he's back at that pr previous firm now. And he's one of our like direct contacts yeah. for, so, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a small community. Yeah. This, this, the, the independent adjusting community. I mean, there aren't that many people that do this. Um, and they bounce around. I yep. mean, they, they, they'll, I, I don't want to, I, I can't, I don't want to throw anybody's names out there, but there's, there's several people that we're just now talking about. Yep. You know who I'm talking there's about. There's one young lady. Uh, yeah, yeah. She took her whole team from one company to another. Yeah. Right. Or I don't think she did that exactly, but she's ended up, you know, yep. and somebody that works for the company that she currently works for went to work for another company and took his whole team over there. Yeah. You know, they just, they just rotate. Like, you know, I was in the car business for a while. The same thing happened there. I mean, management got fired out of one place and they bring in one guy. He brings his whole team and that people that were here went over to the other dealership. You know, exactly. they just switched management and it's, yeah. it, it happens. They only either live in Mobile or Dallas. Yep. <laughs> Pretty much. There's Pretty a few much. in Florida. But. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that happened to me this past year when I was just talking to a company and I told them, hey, um, you know, do you, you know, we talked about deployments. We talked about, you know, do you feel claims, things like that. I even asked him, Hey, you know, I know a lot of people out there don't like doing virtual assist claims, but I actually don't mind going out and doing photos and scopes. Does your company do that? You know, if you're new, okay, that is probably one of the greatest ways of honing your skills, getting out there and, and, and scoping and taking photos and working on virtual assist. I know that we're, I'm going to get lit up by a bunch of, a bunch of, old school guys that are going, yeah, but they're ruining the industry and they're taking our jobs away from us. And we, you know what? It's, it's progress and technology is going to happen. It's stuck. We're stuck with it. There's nothing we can do. You know, either yeah. we can sit home and do nothing and cry about it or we can pay our bills, you know, and it's, uh, it's happening whether we like, it well, whether we like it or not. And, and let me tell you this, I made some really, really good money when I first started doing this. That's all I did was just virtual assist. And I was putting some serious dough in the bank every week. And to sit there and complain about it when you're sitting at home doing nothing or you're knocking out maybe four claims a week for 350 bucks a pop and I'm running circles around you income-wise, tell me I'm doing the wrong thing, okay? But well, that's another tangent. We'll go off on right. another day. But, you know, because I had reached out to people and said, hey, look, I'm willing to travel. I'm willing to do this. This is, you know, does your company do this? Because this is what I'd be interested in. When I was on the road this year, I had made some social media post about, where I was at. Okay. Next thing I know, I'm getting contacted going, Hey James, how far are you away from this? And I said, I'm about 250 miles away. I said, uh, if we paid you, would you go over and just photo and scope and write some and, and sketch some stuff for us? And, uh, and this is what we'll pay you. I said, I'm leaving here tomorrow. I can hit it on my way back out of town on the way home. I made enough money 
I was going that direction anyway the next day. Okay. I got paid mileage to get to that place. I got paid to photoscope it and they paid me very well to do it. And it paid for my trip home and my hotel room, you know, uh, and I had cash left over for when I made off of that deal. Yeah. You know, it paid for all my gas all the way home, all my travel expense, everything for that one claim. And that's because I asked a question and the person saw it and I connected with them on uh, social media and they saw where I was at. And, uh, and it created that one opportunity. And since then, I've done quite a few more assignments for them. So yeah. it's just – so ask questions that pertain to what – that leads to showcasing what you're willing to do. Yep. yep. Not what you're willing – not what you're not willing to do. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So – and and even going further than that, just to, just to kind of like build on this a little bit. I mean, like we're – basically we're saying relationship building is a big deal. Mm-hmm. in this in this industry in particular because it is so small and so if you're sitting there and maybe you don't have a whole lot of experience maybe you don't have any experience you just have some training or whatever but you're willing to to go and do whatever it is that they need you to do if they're trying to build their virtual assist or their photo and scope division or whatever because the carriers are the ones that are asking for that it's not mm-hmm. firms want to field fully you know, licensed and like fully paid field adjusters who can make decisions and everything else. But the carriers are trying to, it's just, it is what it is, right? Um, If you're developing rapport with those people, you got to remember that people like to work with people that they like, Mm -hmm. right? So if if you are friendly and you smile and you're not like, you know, got closed body language or whatever, and you're nervous and scared and, oh, did I do okay? You know, whatever. If you're a personable person, this is a customer service job, right? They can take that and build you into what they need you to be, right? So if, if you don't come with all the parts, but you seem like somebody that would be easy to work with and willing to do whatever it takes, then you're going to be much more valuable than somebody who's like, like you said, putting up a wall of, well, I'm absolutely not doing that. I don't work in Texas. I mean, Texans are a bunch of, you know, hillbillies, whatever. So you've got like, you have a bunch of rules that they, you know, that you're putting a block you're blocking them out on things. They they don't want to work with that guy. They don't want to work with a guy who's going to be cranky and say, you know, and whatever you do, I mean, are you the kind of company that's going to like, you know, try to get me to go drive 250 miles one way? I mean, I'm not doing that. I mean, I, the mileage and it's not even, doesn't even cover the da 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 and start complaining or whatever. D and H is going on that resume. Right. Right. I'm not even, that guy's not even going to get on the roster. Yep. Right. And the people out there have attitudes like that. I don't understand why. It's- I loved watching. Speaking of NACA, I watched this one guy and this guy was was all over the place and he was very proud of himself. You know, and I just happened to be walking by two or three times when he was interviewing. And he basically said, I won't work for less than 70 percent of the yeah. schedule. You know, and and I heard the person say, well, then I guess we're just not a fit. And he goes, well, I made this much money this, you know, in the past, and I should be able to still make that. And, and uh, I remember the guy in the interview said, so what did you make last year? <laughs> just like that. And the guy just says, that's, that's, that's not relevant. And he goes, well, kind of is, you yeah. know. And it just went back and forth. It's like, well, you know, what's the, you know. You, but you don't know what my fee schedule is. So if I'm paying, if you're making 70% of a crap fee schedule, yeah, you know, you're making less than my 50% of a great fee schedule or whatever it ends up being or right. 60% or whatever. 50%, it ends up don't say that. I'm not saying 50%. <laughs> Hopefully but, it's uh, not down there yet. I've never signed anything for that and I never would. But uh, that that was just kind of the, the gist of it. I think, I think we got 75%. Years. I don't work for less than 55% of the. Well, I will tell you this, that we're, that we're kind of going down this little rabbit hole there. I have a standard in which I will work by, okay? And I have turned down a lot of work from companies that don't want to pay me. So on the auto side, it works a little bit different. Um, you have a fee schedule that you submit to the company, and they either, because you're independent, they can't tell you what they're going to pay you, okay? 100%. I mean, that's it. And they can sit there. They'll sign your contract. You can give them your fee schedule and they'll just decide not to use you because you're too high but yet you're still on the roster because they you know if they're desperate they'll give you a call um 
I know a lot of people that work for the same firms I do and they, they get paid less money. Okay. That's just because I went in and said, this is what I'm willing to do. And, and I delivered on it, you know, and that's the other thing is you can't really walk into a company and demand high dollars if you don't prove who you are and what you can do. And I got lucky due to the fact is that I went to a tough market when I first got into the game. I went out to an area where there was no IAs, uh, basically none. They were desperate for help out there. They had tons of claims. Uh, I upped my fee schedule and said, I'm going out there. This is what I'll work for. They didn't really have a choice not to pay it. Okay. But I went out there and delivered. And once I delivered and showed them what I could do, when I went back home to Dallas, Fort Worth, they've never asked me to change my fee schedule. And they've continued to, to, to send me work yeah. because I proved what I could do. So, you know, if you don't have hit, so now what's happened is whenever I talk to new companies, that I'm trying to get on with and they tell me that's not what they pay. And, and I'm sitting there going, well, you know, I've got extra capacity what I'm going to do here. And I, and I don't want to drop myself. I'll say, well, here's what we can do. You know, this is my fee schedule. This is what I get paid from other companies. Okay. When everybody else drops you and you don't have anybody else to do it, I'll be more than happy to take care of it for you. You know, so just keep me around. Well, what ends up happening is they decide they just want to check you out and they'll shoot you a claim. And then you deliver on that claim, and then you'll start seeing a little bit more trickling. That's been my experience. I'm not saying it's going to work for everybody, but that's how I've kind of built mine, and that's how I've been able to get my fee schedules up. Yeah. So that's a different topic that we're going on a tangent here. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's uh, it's what's worked for me. And, again, it all came from asking questions and, and being willing to do things that other people aren't willing to do. And I found out what these companies needed by asking questions. Hey, hey, Mr. Insured, how's it going? It's going great today. How are you doing? <laughs> right. This is actually Guy Grant from Veteran Adjusting School. So you want to learn claims from the most experienced veteran adjusters, but you can't find anybody who will let you ride along with them? Then let me tell you about Adjuster TV Plus. Developed by Adjuster TV and its industry partners, including the high-end training center Veterans Adjusting School in Arizona, Adjuster TV Plus is a growing library of in-depth training videos created just for independent adjusters. Learn scoping and estimating from professional trainers and adjusters. Learn how to handle customer interactions with confidence. Learn the ins and outs of scoping and estimating exterior hail claims. And detailed videos about how to handle smoke, ice dam, water claims, and auto claims. Adjuster TV Plus also features the very best of three years of Adjuster TV's YouTube videos. Educational, entertaining, and inspiring. Come ride along with us on Adjuster TV Plus. So I could find out where I fit into the, yeah. or, find find into the organization. The, find out what their needs are, <clears throat> develop some rapport, and let them know that you're uh, Johnny, or in this case, Julie, on the spot. Because yeah. Emily asked this question. Um, it's a great question, Emily. Um, by the way, Emily has been uh, working most of this year. Awesome. Since she went through the property path thing. Um, so, very cool. All right, so we have one here, which I think is, uh, it's almost like a war story one, but it's, it's a good, it's a good question. It's a good segue. It is. So it's not a good segue. Okay, never mind. So uh, a gentleman by the name of Jerry, or it could be a woman. No, it's Junior, so it's a man. Jerry Essery Jr. asks, or he didn't really ask, he just says, heavy damage for newbies, which I think is. Perfect question because right. this is what happens, especially when you get on a big first cat event mm -hmm. and they're going to, on a big hurricane, they just throw the claims out there. Yep. Whoever, whatever you get is what you get. You might get total losses on the coast. You might get tree on fence, tree on fence, tree on fence, a hundred miles in one. Um, on any, really any other kind of storm, if you're on hail, I mean, heavy damage is, it's, it could all technically be light damage or heavy damage, but it's not like it's catastrophic. Right. They're not paying any ALE. Yes. I've never paid ALE on a hail claim. You didn't work the Wiley, Texas storm. I did not work in one of those storms. <laughs> so, all right. So, so heavy damage for newbies. What do you do? What happens? Um, I had a claim I, the first time, and I, and I confess, I chickened out and I gave it back to, to the, I gave it back to him. Because what happened was, it was a way to snow claim 
on Long Island. And it was that was a pretty stressful storm. It was like my third or fourth deployment total of my whole career. Um, that was my third deployment or fourth deployment. Um, and it was early in the year. And that was, that was one of my biggest years too. It was like, right. so way to snow claims in Long Island, New York. And I called the homeowner, set up the appointment and he's like, yeah, we got a little damage to the garage. It's not, you know, it's not really a big deal. You just come on out and check it out. You'll see it. And I was like, can you give me an, ex- an idea of the extent of the damage? He's like, yeah, just come on out. You'll see. You know, that. I was like, okay, whatever. He sounded totally chill about it. So I get out there and he's got a, a two story, like just a straight gable. I mean, it's a real basic house. It's like typical for that part of the country with an attached garage, which was one story with the same roof line. And the attached garage was completely pancaked. The walls were out Ooh. and the, the roof was laying on top of the car that was d- inside the garage, along with everything else that was in the garage, which was a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. And the, the one wall on the end was out this way. And it was just like completely flattened. I didn't even get up to the, I pulled up to it and I called my manager. I said, I, this, I can't do this one. I, I had no idea what to do with it. I had right. no clue. And, I, and it, I freaked. I got the yips. And he's like, no, no, you can take, you can do it. Just get, get pictures or whatever. I know I take it away. All right. You know, which was a demerit because you don't want to give, it, right. I just made work for my manager. Right. So right. he's got to find somebody else to do it. Whoever got that claim was probably like, heck yeah, that's good damage. Right. It's a right. lot of damage. So I, you know, that's one of the few times I've ever given a claim back. And since then, like pretty much almost immediately after that, I was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Um, but it, I, in the moment I just made a, I made a snap wrong decision. Um, when I was working on hurricane Sandy, I was a field support manager and I had probably two dozen adjusters that were my sort of my responsibility. Um, this is the international hand symbol for responsibility. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, some of them were experienced adjusters. And so when I dealt with those guys, it was, Hey Matt, I need you to make, make a call on this one. I want to try to total this for a fight. I need you to get, to get your approval. Okay. I meet me out there, whatever. Um, and then the rest of them, a good 15 or 16 of them were all just noobs, new as a shiny new brand new penny kind of brands making new. Um, and there was a lot of, there was a, on Sandy, there was a lot of, it was almost all wind where we were, um, and a lot of trees down on the fence, that kind of stuff. But we had some claims, some big, big old trees that had, I mean, huge, like gigantic trees on the side of a hill like this with a big old house with a slate roof and like brick and plaster and everything else with a three story walkout on the back and the root ball had grown into the foundation and it tree fell over that way. And basically it's like taking the corner of the house and did that to it. And it's like, just the corner of the house is gone and you can see inside the, you know, the bathroom upstairs and this closet and that thing down there or whatever. And it looks like a dollhouse, Right. And I met an, a brand spanking new adjuster out there and he was in his, he was in his fifties. And I think he had been a teacher before and he heard about claims and he's like, Oh, I think I can do it. And he has his little, his little bag and everything in his glasses. And he was like so timid and he was absolutely, he was shaking. He was so nervous about what to do with this claim. He's like, I don't, it's like, I don't know what to do, Matt. And I'm like, well, it's just this. And to answer your question, heavy damage for newbies, what do you do when you get that claim? Cause chances are, if you get deployed to a big hurricane or something like that as your first storm, you're going to get one of these claims. Right. Or if your first storm happens to be, in a year like 2020 where it was every kind of storm possible happened, wildfires, they don't have anybody to work the wildfire, so they're sending noobs out on that, right? You're going to get total losses. You're going to get big losses. You're going to get catastrophic damage that have that activate a bunch of different parts of the policy. You just have to start. It's like, you know, eating an elephant. It's one bite at a time. One right? bite. Start, yep. with the, start with the toe because that's the th- part that's on your foot, right? So, right. Or on your chest, rather. Your foot's on your chest. So when you're doing a claim like that, and I think with the way we did this, in that one particular claim, 
it was, we'll start at the top and work our way down and we'll work our way in from there, right? And we'll just look at each room and just what's in there, right? You know, a, a building is mostly air, right? It's a right. box with, it's mostly empty space. And the walls are made of something on the outside, a piece of plywood probably, you know, unless it was solid brick like this was. But just generally speaking, then you've got some framing to hold everything up and then some insulation in there. And then you might have a vapor barrier and then you've got the inside finish, right? And then in the bathroom, you got some tile on top of that. Yep. Special kind of drywall for that. Flooring is a floor covering, an underlayment, and then a subfloor and framing, maybe some insulation and then some cap. I mean, it's, there's not that much. There's only, I just listed off this many parts. Right. And that's that's a house, right? You know, electrical and plumbing. It's, get your measurements, man. Get, get your measurements. Put be systematic. In, put it in, put it in, uh, Exactimate and guess what it does? Yeah, it does the work, most of the work for you. All you got to do is put in the freaking measurements. Yep, yep. So, some people, I, I, I didn't know, realize this was a thing until I, I just, I didn't know. Some people will go and they'll take photos, like especially like if they're doing flood or they're doing interior mm -hmm. damage, they'll just walk around and just take photos of the inside of the room. They'll get a couple measurements and then they'll go leave and go off to the next room. They don't write down anything. Those, well, later on, I'll just I'll just scope for my photos. I mean, I sure. I mean, I theoretically I think that works, but I would much rather I'll write down on my scope sheet exactly what I'm going to do, like in Xactimate, because I mean you do yeah. enough claims, you memorize exact all the Xactimate codes, right? So if I'm in this room, I'm starting at the ceiling and I'm working my way down, right? So I'm gonna what am I gonna do on the ceiling? I'm gonna paint. I'm gonna seal. I'm gonna do some of this. I'm gonna do some of that. On the wall, I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing. And then on the floor, I'm going to do, you know, this. And I'm going to clean sh heavy shampoo and whatever, right? So you, so I have a list of the things that I'm going to do. And if for a, a, it might be a block of text that big, you know, written kind of big on like college ruled paper, right? Yep. That kind of, that size. And then I have my diagram and I have all the measurements, right? So I don't have to go back and look. I don't look at the photos when I'm writing my estimate. I have what a pain in the butt. Like, how are you going to do yeah, that? I don't do that. I have a bunch of screens up or whatever. So I just look at my scope sheet and just type in what's there and then it's done. Or I've popped my macro in and delete the things that aren't there and put the measurements in, you know, put the, you dimension the room or you sketch, right? Yep. And that's it. And I, my error rate for that kind of thing is a lot lower than if I'm just like, you know, trying to scope from, well, oops, I forgot that measurement. My first, my first um, field claim was my first property claim was a metal roof was blown off the house just ceilings collapsed you know everything i get to the house it's gutted you know um sir pro had already gotten out there you know and it's the house is just basically gutted and you had like through the bedroom you had this like entryway that was kind of this triangular shape and then the bathroom was all so it basically took a square room they put a diagonal wall across it, okay? And one side was like this little sitting room, the other half was the bathroom, right. okay? And so this is my first one. So now I'm having to deal with these weird angle size walls and some other stuff. And all I did, man, I just walked in there, common sense said, take your measurements and draw your diagram. I wasn't experienced as you, you know, and walking around my little computer stand and doing it as I go because I didn't, I, I, I did I figured if I tried to do that on my first one, I'd be there all day, you know, yeah, trying to get it yeah. done. So I had, I just sat there and I just diagrammed the room, took my measurements and took every measurement I could make, every inset, every, everything I could find. And I just measured it and I drew the diagram as I went along. And then whenever I sat down to Xactimate, you know, I had my diagram right there. I knew exactly what to do, yeah. you know, and just, and it just, and I, and what was great was once I could, finished diagramming that room and the two closets that were in there and the, the little sitting room and the, and all the angles and all that stuff. And I had it laid out there on the floor plan. My manager looked at it and goes, that's a heck of a job on that diagram, you know, because I just wrote it down. You know I yeah. mean? It was when I first walked into it, I was pretty intimidated. Now I'd been through this similar situation myself just a few years before during the Wiley hail storm that took out the roof and my whole entire house. I got every ceiling, every wall, all the flooring was replaced in my house. So I've kind of been through this a little bit, but even then I wasn't the guy writing the claim. You know, I wasn't the guy doing the repairing, but I just kind of watched what those guys did and thought, okay, maybe that's what I should do. And I made it through it. 
you know, my first, yeah. my first, my first property claim and, you know, got kudos for it. it just don't overthink it, man. Don't just overthink make, it. Just, just, just make it easy, man. Just take measurements and draw diagrams. It's not that it's more the, complicated. It's just that it takes a little bit longer yep. to get all the information, right? So if, if you have a claim where all you're doing is replacing six shingles, as an adjuster, of all the things that you've got to have, there is really none more important than your state adjuster license, especially your very first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else. Some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. Adjuster TV has partnered with Adjuster Pro because Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as a claims professional. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjusterpro right now. You're doing the same steps as if the, you're doing the whole roof, the framing, the drywall, and everything else, right? You're just adding all more things to it. I guess right. it's more complica- complex, but it's it's just a matter of having a system being systematic. Did you know that if you uh, go to Adjuster TV Plus and go through the Xactimate course, there is some macros in there that you there can- There is? Yes, there is. That's fantastic. And you can, you can import those into Xactimate, and so when you- Come across a situation like this where it's heavy damage, you just drop in that macro and you just delete the things that are not there. And all you're doing is just doing your sketch, putting your measurements, and it's all there for you. You know what's also in there? What's that? There are activity diary templates. Yes, there's that, there's that in there. There's yeah. also three or four. I can't remember exactly, but there's, there's a small handful of complete – um, estimate templates or ESX yep. files. One of them is a smoke, a wildfire smoke claim, and it's got every, every possible room, every possible thing, all with all of the line items that are associated with doing a smoke claim. Which is, if you don't know what that is, not every wildfire claim is has burn damage. Yep. There may be 150 burned houses and then 15,000 houses with smoke. Smoke. All yep. it was was just smoke. Everything stinks, and there's a stain on everything. Yep. So that's, those are, if you're going to get wildfire claims, a lot of times you're going to get smokers. Um, so yeah, adjustertvplus.com. Check yeah, that out. Check it out and get some free macros. And that matter of fact, the, the field claim that I was uh, talking about, that uh, I was just talking about, that's how I wrote it. Uh, yeah. Was with, with those, those macros. macros. Yep. Uh, so uh, one thing I want to <laughs> say about the macros and, the, and, the, and those, those items, I, I, and I've talked to exact about this specifically, um, mm-hmm. that it's, if you have the trial version of Xactimate, you can't do it. It won't. It won't import yeah. them for some reason. Right. So you have to have to be paid. You have to pay, pay for version. Xactimate before to let you import that stuff. Correct. Uh, unfortunately, but they're aware of it. I don't know if they're going to change it because I don't know if it's. I doubt it. Probably not. But so. But anyway, that's just my two cents. I mean, okay. this was a heavily damaged house, and and I went in there and just made some measurements, sketched it while I went, and then whenever I sat down with my. And that's another thing is that when you're doing heavy damage, you know, and you're, and you're out scoping, you will never get a file rejected for too many photos. No. (laughs) Okay. It just creates a lot more work for you. It creates a lot more headache, but so, and and the reason why I'm saying that is document, the more time you spend documenting, getting details out in the field, especially when you're new. Okay. Because you're, I mean, right now you got so much flying at you. You've got the anxiety of a new claim, a new career. You want to get this right and everything else. And that anxiety will cause you to forget things. Okay. So document as much as you can. Take lots of photos. That doesn't mean you have to upload all those photos. Okay. True. Sometimes those photos are just for your reference to go back to later. But take as many photos as you can. Again, I wouldn't write my estimate off of those photos. I would just be, if I'm in the middle of my estimate, can't remember something, go back and look at my photos. But you know, draw diagrams while you're out there, you know, uh, make the more time you spend. So many people worry about speed more than they do efficiency, you know? Right. And I would rather spend an extra 30 minutes to 40 minutes on property doing solid notes and sketches. That way, whenever I do finally get sit down to do the whole claim, you know, I've, I've got it. I got what I need. I don't have yeah. to second guess myself. Oh, I missed that 
you know, geez, what was this? Second, you got to guess. Second, you, know, you start. And, and it, trouble. it, I, I just can't stress that, you know, that spend a little extra time, the, the extra 20 to 30, 40 minutes you might spend on a property is going to save you an hour down the road. Yeah. Especially if you got to redo your inspection. Yeah. It's going to save you a lot. So that's, that's my two cents on that, but that's my, um, that's why I got through my first heavy damaged, um, severity one claim. Severity one. We got a hot one. Severity one is what they call Um, it. Which brings up an interesting question. You know, when you're prioritizing or triaging claims, Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times when you, when you do hail claims, you're not doing this because they're all the same. Even if the worst damn, I mean, Wiley, you know, seven inch hail or whatever you guys right. had there, notwithstanding normal, regular old Health, garden variety yeah. hail, not Ailey. There's no, you know, you're not paying for people's TVs inside because the hail came all the way through the ceiling. Um, this, the worst hail claim that you'll get is not an emergency, right. right? It's not a big, it's not a, it's not a big deal. I mean, it's a big, it's a big deal, but it's not like a, right. On the other hand, if you have like, for example, hurricane claims, wind claims, tree chops through the middle of the house, you know, this is, and it's typical for really any kind of like windstorm, whether it's a hurricane or it's a derecho or it's a, just a regular, uh, windstorm. Um, when we talk about triaging claims like that, I think that people think that they need to go see those first. And those may be the ones that you may need to wait on a little bit because for a couple of reasons, if you have a a tree on a house, great big old tree and it's the house is not inhabitable. If you go out to to try and try to scope that house, like what are you going to look at? You can't go inside with a tree on it. You can't go inside. You probably can't get up on the roof. You probably can't see because especially if it's in the summer or like late spring and there's the trees leafed out. Yep. You can't see anything, right? So you can't see what the damage looks like. You just, and you're not going to, it's, it's difficult to access that property and get and do a good scope. So you're going to have to wait for the tree guy to come out and get the tree off. A lot of times they're, they're Johnny on the spot and they're going to be out there and get it taken care of. Right. Um, we can talk about tree bills <laughs> in another, you know, but the people that, that, uh, are, I think the, the kind of the long and short of it with when you were talking about triaging claims or severity one claims or, you know, hot claims or whatever, it's, you still have to take into consideration. It's almost like Tetris, right? You're fitting right. things into, you want to, to be as fit, efficient as possible. If you can get everybody taken care of quickly, then it doesn't really matter, right? If you're able to get to everybody within the first week or 10 days, then it's, you know, the, the, it may take eight days for the guy to get the tree off the house is the right. point. You don't go look at that guy the first day. You know, you want to like, it's almost like you want to do the Dave Ramsey snowball method, right? Yep. Where you take your, your smallest debt. one first. Yeah. Biggest to smallest, start with your smallest one. And then you compound into the Remember it's one. closing claims. It's closing claims. It's volume, right? So we want to close claims. We don't want to like waste time, you know, spending a day and a half going back and forth with this guy who's, you know, trying to get him to get the tree off the house. Just wait for him to get the tree off the house. Okay. Right. You know, make the appointment, get him, get him a spot. Say, we'll make, you know, the tree guy said he couldn't be here until Saturday and today's Monday. Right. Well, let's make an appointment for Sunday. Right. Just lock him into an appointment. If, he, if the tree's still on there, if the guy couldn't get out, then we'll just bump him. Right. But we've got something to put into this, our status or our activity diary. Right. He's got it. He's been contacted. He knows that we have an expectation of, the next step is, is the ingester is going to come out if the tree's off, if the tree's not off, we're going to reschedule for another one. So having everybody in a spot is critical right. for, for me. Um, but you want to get like, like if you're working, like you said, you did, you closed five over the phone, right? They probably right. gave you some authority to 2,500 bucks right. or under or whatever it was to say, Hey, well, so you oh, four sections of fence, you know, blown down. Okay. No problem. Here's your money. Right yep. over the phone, and you—I don't know if you could—could could you bill full price for that, or was it hourly, or what was that? That was, as far as fee goes. Yeah, that was hourly. That's what that one was. Right. right. So, in some cases, like I mean, they've been doing that for years and years. That kind of thing they call it express claims handling yep. or fast tracking or whatever they call it. 
do those first. Like do, this is how you would triage. Can you send me some photos real fast? Great. Boom. Page. Yeah. Text me the photos. So when you triage your claims, you're looking at like the big ones. I'm going to pull the big ones out, you know, house uninhabitable, put them over here in this pile. All the ones that look like, you know, water spot on ceiling roof is leaking, you know, no tree on house or no, nothing like that. It's small. I'm making a pile over here and I'm going to, I'm going to contact everybody mm -hmm. and make appointments. And then I'm going to call all these guys and try to close them over the phone for sure. Right. Um, and then they're done, right? Those five or seven or 12 or whatever it is. Cause again, on hurricanes in particular, you may have catastrophic damage on the coast that gets all over the news. And then there's tens of thousands of claims inland tree on fence, three shingles blown off water spot. You know, whenever I worked Hurricane Laura, I went nowhere near Lake Charles. The closest yeah. I got to Lake Charles was a hundred miles. Wow. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and I was working, you know, places nobody would even think about, but that's, you know, I got kind of lucky. I didn't have to go in the middle of all that stuff, but, uh, yeah. you know, but I had plenty of work to do. Lots of work to do. Nope. Nope. So all I, my claims, except for one, I had one claim in Waveland, Mississippi on Katrina. The rest of them were all inland. Yeah. All, I mean, there were some big ones too. I mean, it was tree and there's lots of big trees down there and they, they chopped into the middle of this guy's house and, you know, so on. But the rest of them were, I had a lot of mobile homes on that one. Yeah. Okay. So I think we covered heavy damage for newbies and how to do it. I think we did. Okay. Good job. <laughs> You're Thanks. the man. Thanks, man. So. So, all right. So let's talk a little bit about giving people the benefit of the doubt. This is just kind of a general topic. So when we're talking about a customer service job, like claims property and auto claims, really, I think right. any kind of claims adjusting, we'll just throw that out there. We are talking about anybody who owns a house has to have homeowner's insurance, right? So you, you're getting across if they have a mortgage. The, yeah. If they have a mortgage, they have to have a homeowner's insurance. Um, most people have it anyway. Right. Um, you are getting, you know, the cross section of American society, maybe this, you're probably going to get like this chunk of it. It's a big mm. chunk, right? right? You're not going to get the very, very top and the very, very bottom probably. Um, although you will sometimes, but mm. mostly it's going to be in the suburbs and it's going to be right. like, you know, the middle, kind of the middle class, but you're getting the full spectrum of people. You run into all kinds of people from all different walks of life from everywhere people from over you know people from overseas who come and move to the states uh, people who move from you know meet a new yorker in texas and a texan in new jersey and Don't all california that. my texas exactly yeah. so and you meet people who have different ideas and attitudes about everything right and these are it's just it's a you can't pick who you whose house you go to right sometimes you run into people who are so rude or so mean that it almost it takes you by surprise how like awful this person is acting to oh, you. Oh yeah. And it's you don't know why. And this goes back to not taking things personally. You know, when that happens, sometimes you have to remember that people have lives outside of this claim, right? And their lives are different than yours. This woman who is being mean to you or you know whatever being rude or being short or whatever she may have just found out that her daughter's high school daughter's pregnant right. you have no idea what's going on or this guy who's like acting weird and doesn't make eye contact with you and seems kind of distracted and, and is doesn't seem to care that you're there or not his wife may have just died right or maybe he just found out he has terminal cancer this is people, people's lives. Right. It's, it's all over the board, right? Disasters don't stop for personal problems. Exactly. You know, and, and people's personal problems are, are a disaster and they may be a much bigger disaster than what's going on at the yeah. house. The other thing is, is that if you don't, if you have a water spot on the ceiling, like I had a, I had a, a claim, I filed a claim on my house years ago because I had a hailstorm hit. And then the gutter backed up into the house and it got a big water stain on the ceiling in the kitchen. 
small little thing, right? You look at that. Like, ah. When I go to somebody else's house, that's no big deal. At uh, my house, that's a big deal. I gotta find, either find somebody to, to to do it or jump on YouTube and you know go to Home Depot and buy some tools and try to paint it, make it match, or whatever. It's it's a pain in the butt. I gotta deal with the contractor. I gotta deal. I gotta be home for them, right? It's not a small thing. The smallest claim is not a small thing, right? So my kind of my, the reason why I'm talking about this is that be, because as, as a customer facing person that we're dealing with people of, who are in the, the complete spectrum of anything that can happen to anybody at any time could be happening to that person. They may have chronic pain, yep. right? And maybe why they're, they, they've threw their back out. Or they just got they have surgery and they're recovering. Who knows, right? Chronic pain. I mean, you've had chronic pain. You've had back. Yeah. You've had issues. Yeah. I've had you know back pain or whatever. You think you're gonna, you know, you're not gonna die, but you're like, this is the way my life is gonna be forever now, and I have to deal with this pain and it hurts. You and there's sleep. days where you're just going, I just rather amputate my leg at this point. Yeah, exactly. You know. So when you run into people who who seem like they're pissed off at you, or they're being rude for whatever reason, it may be it has nothing to do with you, right? So I'm going to show up and I'm going to provide the exact same, maybe even a little bit more empathetic, uh, a, a customer service level to that person who's being rude to me, not because I don't want him to be rude to me, but just because I don't want to be the source of additional like stress and anxiety for them because that can cause the whole thing to spin out if they already have problems going on and then they get this claim that they have to deal with. And that starts to, you know, I'm taking it personally and I'm like, well, you know, I've been an adjuster for da 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 years, and I, you know, my experience and blah blah. blah. Where's my resume? You know, right. come on, stop. Handle the claim. Let this per reassure this person. Let them know that they're going to get taken care of, in whatever way you can. Sometimes you can't, so you still have to be reassuring and help them in other ways, right? Be a be a light. You know what I mean? Don't yep. don't. My my whole point is I'm not saying it's you. I mean, we're saying it's the, the listeners, obviously, but or the viewers. Um is that we have opportunities every day as claims adjusters to, if not make a, a small difference in somebody's life, to just not be a part of the problem. Do you know what I mean? And us taking things personally, it always is going to make problems, always. You know, one of the things that I've witnessed other adjusters do is that when they go to do their inspection, this person may have never had to deal with a claim in their life. Yeah, most okay? people. And for them, this is, for lack of a better term, somewhat traumatic. They've never had to deal with it. It's outside their normal routine. It's disrupted their life. Yeah. And they have, life has to go on, and they have to deal with this issue. Well, the adjuster is standing there saying, yeah, well, in 2016... I lived in Wiley, Texas, and my house got destroyed. It was nothing like this. I mean, this is just minor compared to what I went through. So everything's going to be okay. I have witnessed that, okay? And I just want to just reach over there and slap the crap out of that person for saying that because, hey, you know what? Yeah, you may have gone through something worse than what you see this person going through right now, yeah. okay? But they're not you, you know? This yeah. is their pain. This is their tragedy. This is their event. Yep. You know, and just because yours was bigger doesn't doesn't make theirs any less severe for them. Yeah. You know, in addition to that, exactly what you just said, you don't know what else is going on in their life right now. Their job, their job might be holding on by a thread because they have this new management that came in or whatever. And he's worried about his job. And now he's going to take time off to come over and deal with this problem, you know, and 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 now here it is. You're like. Yeah. Act, acting like, yeah, it's no big deal to them. This is the quickest way to have somebody complain about you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, be Not be empathetic to this person's problem or try to make their problem seem insignificant compared to what you've gone through. It's just it's not good customer service, number one. Number two is I would tell you right now, if I ever had an adjuster do that to me in my house, and I'm not some snowflake that's going to get my feelings hurt easy. I would just sit there and, and I would just tongue lash the crap out of them, <laughs> you know, yeah. because I don't care about you, man. This ain't about you right now. This is about me and my disaster, me and my claim, yeah. not the claim that you went through. 
Okay. Yeah. I'm not here to console you for what you went through four or five years ago. Okay. Or to affirm that you went through something bad four or five years ago. You know, your job here is right now is to make my situation better. That's right. Not for me to affirm you. You know, so that's that's a that's a pet peeve with mine. I'm so glad you brought it up. <laughs> well, I mean, you know. when it all comes down to it, it's is a customer service job. And even yep. though we talk about volume and closing claims quickly, that is also all of these things that I talk about, if you do them well, all serve customer service, right? Because the faster you can turn a claim around, the faster the insurer gets a check in their mm-hmm. hand, the faster they can get started on the work get back to normal, right? But if you do a crappy job and they got a, a reinspection comes and a supplement and this and that, then that slows the whole thing down to a crawl. And mm-hmm. that is your customer service just plummets, right? If you if you develop rapport with the insured, super easy to do. Mm-hmm. Talk about what they're interested in, right? Mm-hmm. You've walked up to somebody's house and they've you're got to see something. You're gonna see something. It's Dogs, not anything. Cats, bumper sticker on a car that tells their favorite sports team. Motorcycle. Yeah. Classic car in the garage. Yeah. Nice landscaping. It's clearly they spent a little bit more time than their yeah. neighbors did. They're proud of that. Talk. Yeah. Oh my gosh. The, you know, I didn't tell me about the whatever. You know, you, yeah. you start talking to them. I really like your flowers. Oh, well, thank you so much. And then they can start talking about that. Oh, really? And then you can have a conversation. It's super easy to do. You go inside somebody's house, you can tell them if they take pride in something on the inside of their house. Maybe their house is their hoarders, but they've got a fly tying bench that is like perfectly like organized and everything. Oh, you're a fly fisherman. Oh yeah. Let me tell you all about it. Blah, blah, blah. And you're in there with stuff stacked and there's garbage mm-hmm. on the floor or whatever you can find. There's something. There's right? always something. Always something. And even if there isn't, find, f- f- there's universal things that you can talk about with people. I mean, you can figure something out. If you're interested in getting the absolute best property claims training available, then I want to tell you about my friends over at Veteran Adjusting School in Sedona, Arizona. As a licensed vocational school, Veteran Adjusting School trains you to become a complete insurance adjuster with a focus on catastrophe property adjusting. When you graduate from the Voss trained insurance adjuster program, you're ready to begin your exciting new career, whether as a daily adjuster or as a cat adjuster. Listen, there are many outstanding adjuster schools out there and you have to get some training somewhere. But Voss stands out among its peers for the depth and breadth of its program, as well as its continuing support and mentorship for graduates long after students become working adjusters. Go to adjustertv.com slash VAS now and chat with an enrollment specialist who will answer all of your questions and help you decide if Voss is the right choice for you. Adjustertv.com slash VAS. I can't think of anything right at the moment. Right. You know, and one of the things that I try to, whenever I could tell that the person is probably a little on edge a little bit, a little stressed out, maybe, you know, you can just tell there's some, they're not comfortable either. There's just something's not right. Yeah. You know, I will make it a point to say, have you ever dealt with a claim like this before? You know, and if they haven't, okay, I like to tell them this is what you can expect. You know, oh, yeah. just tell them, okay, look, this is how, this is how we got to this point, And this is what to expect from this point forward. And this is my responsibility to you. Okay. And each person involved in this process, this is what their responsibility is. This way they have an understanding of it. And you will be amazed at how fast that person went from being standoffish with a wall up and everything else, not making eye contact or, you know, just wanting to get out of your presence real fast to just all of a sudden opening up and thanking you and, 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 yeah. uh, and now, you know, they're asking you if you want to go bowling. Yeah. yeah. You know, Can I you mean, it's, beer? yeah, I mean, it's just, it's no, it's because you've, you've taken an interest in them and what they're going through and, and giving them. And if they say, well, yeah, I've been through this multiple times, man. So, you know what? I'm really sorry you're having to deal with this. Is there anything, any questions you have? Is there anything that I can clear up for you in this process? Just let me know. I'd be more than happy to explain it to you. You know, because yeah. perhaps they've been through this before. It was a bad experience or they were never explained it. So they still don't understand how right, it works, right. you know, yep. or what about the lady who is recently divorced, whose ex-husband used to handle it or whose husband passed away, who always handled these sort of things. And she doesn't know what she's doing and how to handle this. And she's on edge. You know, you can be the person that makes a big difference for them. Yep. You yep. know, and, and it's a great topic. Yeah. I listen, yeah. that's wrap that all that up into a, you know, one little thing. And that is, is that if you're able to, to meet and exceed expectations, communicate people, let people know where they are in the process 
and anticipate. After a while, as, you, as, as a person gets more experience with this, you start to anticipate the questions that always come. Well, what if a contractor says it's going to be more? You're, that's part of your, it becomes part yep. of your spiel before they even ask that question. So then they're going to start to open their mouth to ask a question and you're answering it. And then ask, want to ask another one and you're answering it. It's part right. of your like, this is how you're going to get paid. This is what you got to do for this. This is what you got to do for that. And you're a mortgage company, yada, yada, yada. Well, what if the, all the what ifs that you're going to get, you anticipate all those questions. Yep. They're not calling you back. They're not calling their agent and going, I don't, you know, my adjuster said I was only getting half the money and all, how am I supposed to get half a roof and blah, blah, you know, whatever. I thought I was, you know, had replacement cost. You know, if you didn't explain any of that stuff to them in a way that they can understand, then you're going to have endless trouble and your manager's phone's going to ring and his manager's phone's going to ring and you don't want any of those phones ringing. All those no phones ringing. We want to stop all, stop the ring. Hashtag stop the ring. <laughs> Yeah, however, you do have those people who don't completely understand their policy and their deductible. Yeah, well. And, or they have separate deductibles for certain types of incidents. And you, you just you write a twenty up. you write a twenty three twenty four thousand dollar claim and because of depreciation and their eight thousand dollar deductible or ten thousand dollar deductible. They're getting four dollars. They're getting cents. like eighty eight dollars and fourteen cents is what you're writing a check for. And that is not a joke. And no, when you and when you're on the phone explaining this to them and they're losing their stuff, you know. I'm gonna listen. That's the conversation I want to have in that guy's living room. You know, way. and uh, yeah, that's what I was coming up to next. I did that one time, explained that over the phone. Next time it happened, I went out in person. Yeah, you know, because yeah. that person is now at their house, not understanding. They're just upset, and you hang up the phone and they're steaming. Versus if you have that conversation in person, okay. They can see that you're sincere about trying to, and what you're doing, and you can explain those problems to them, and you can give them a chance to vent right there on the spot before you leave. Yeah, and that's you know, yeah. So you don't get paid to be a psychiatrist in this scenario, but at the same time, it, that goes a long way. Yep. Okay, you explain to hey, look, we're not saying we're not paying your claim. It's just you've got a high deductible and you have depreciation here. You get the stuff fixed, we're going to release this to you. Okay, you know, and any contractor that you know with is going to work with you in this situation because they understand what they're getting back. You know, you're still only responsible for that deductible, you know, and uh, it's, it's a tough, those are tough conversations. It is. In person or over the phone. And listen, you, you know, a lot of companies, if, if there's a certain storm type, like um, water, like sewer backup, a lot of times there'd be a lot of denials on those because it's not covered without the endorsement. Not everybody has the endorsement or they may be in a place where they don't sell the endorsement. Right. So nobody has the endorsement. So you're doing a lot of denials. A lot of carriers uh, want you to do your denial face to face. They want you to stand there in the insurance house and explain it to them and make sure that they understand, right? And there's ways to soften the blow on that, but you have to be smart about it. So I had this one, mm -hmm. and this one was again. I keep talking about St. Louis, but it's uh, you love that place. I work there a lot for some reason. Anyway, so I go to this guy's house and. He's, he's kind of a, he's an energetic person. He's a little kind of a more petite fella and he's got like long, like yeah. bright red hair and, um, follow me around, like right on my heel, like the whole time, just like talking. And he had had his sewer backup claim, no endorsement, no nothing. And we we're down in his basement and his basement, he was a little bit of a hoarder. Mm -hmm. Um, and not, the house is not in great shape and it was, there's a lot of dirt and stuff everywhere, not well taken care of. And you're down in his basement and he's got this stereo system that he said that he got in Vietnam He brought it back from Vietnam yeah. for something. It was supposed to be like this $25,000 stereo system and it was sitting on the floor in water. And there's the, I mean, the floor had been wet right. and it was drying out now, but it was like, and it was like this plush, it was like this green color. This carpet. I'm sure our listeners could see that. Yeah. It was like a dark right. green and it kind of went up the walls like wainscoting, you know, right. and it was, and there was like a water bed down there and like a lava lamp and, you know, old records and stuff. Groovy, man. And I'm walking around and I'm like looking for a source, you know, where's, where's the floor drain? And he's like, they just came in through the walls, is the bottom line, which is not covered in any event, no matter what. Um, and I made the mistake, and I was experienced enough to know that this was a mistake. I made the mistake of 
starting to deny that claim while I was down there in the basement. Oh, this guy's house. <laughs> I'll lock you in. Because he kept asking me, well, how much am I going to get? How much am I going to get? How much am I going to get? And I was like, listen, you know, I didn't like get impatient or snap at him. But I was like, in my mind, I'm like, okay, let's just get this out. So I started to explain, well, well you know, according to the policy, blah, 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 going to go on to the, explain that it's not covered. And this guy lost his mind. He, he, he like started screaming and yelling at me and like shaking his arms around and like, I, and I, he looked like, I mean, I thought he was going to like attack me or stab me or pull a gun out of a drawer or something and, and shoot me. So I just immediately turned around and just like walked down this little narrow hall, stuff stacked and it's a little bare light bulb hanging there and a stairway is down there around the corner. And I'm like, just going as fast as I can. He's right behind me. And it's like a, like a haunted house where you're being chased by the guy with the fake chainsaw, you know? And I get up the stairs and he's just like the whole time. I thought, you know, I mean, when I was in Vietnam, right, right, right. He's on and on and on and on. And my stereo is worth of this, that, and the other thing. I can't even believe you. I mean, you son of a, yeah, this, that, and the other. And it's calling me names out the front door and into the bright sunlight. And I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> straight <laughs> the to the truck. The sun. <laughs> yeah. Straight to the truck, get in the truck, shut the door, start it up. And then like drove away. And he's running across the front yard and like, you know, shaking his fist at me. And I was and he called me later and apologized. He's like, listen, bro, listen, man, I, you know, I'm so sorry. I, I overreacted, man. I'm so sorry. And, you know, but you, so there's no chance this is covered. And it's like, we had had the right. conversation, but I was like, I mean, that was the one time where like the hair was going up on the back of my neck. Spidey senses were kicking in. Yeah. I was like, this is, this could be it. This is, could be the, the big one, the end. So man, that was, that was probably the scariest, like, don't try to deny claims <laughs> while you're standing in somebody's basement. At the front that door, would be bad. You you make your way out through the living room, and you're standing in the front door. Front door is open, kind of thing, or in the yeah. front yard. Good places to do that, but not try not to be inside the house. Good one. So I had this one where uh, it was uh, it's another Southern Louisiana story. This uh, people well, they were Katrina victims, and they moved further inland and further further west and. And uh, had this nice manufactured home, you know, that was, it was actually a very nice place. They had a carport that was attached to the side of the house, went all the way around and covered the patio. And it even attached, they had a detached workshop, you know, and all this was attached. All, every, all, technically, because they're all attached to each other, you could almost call that a single structure. Yeah, you know, I mean, technically, but that's not where we're going with this. <laughs> they had this this vinyl picket fence all the way around their little backyard area, well, they had an above ground pool and everything. And they said, "Yeah." Um, well, so on the front porch, they also had a banister, and that banister was also was also um, you know vinyl fencing type material. And on top of each post, they had those little acorn, you know, looking fence post things. Uh -huh. And and those were, you know, metal. They were, actually, they were brass is what they were. Uh, very nice decorative fence post toppings. And there was only two that you could see on the whole property. And they said every single one of those fence posts had one of those very expensive acorn toppings. I Googled it. I find them. These things are about 35 bucks a piece. It was the cheapest I found them for. Right. Okay. And so I was like, all right, I'll make note of it. So I go around and I measure the fence, you know, and I, I'm counting up each one of them, how many are supposed to be missing, you know, and then I'm, I'm like looking at the house and she said, oh yeah, our front porch is, is now, it's now sagging, you know, and, and I was able to debunk what was causing that you know, issue right. because it actually ended up being the foundation was, was not, but anyway, so as I'm looking at the front porch and I'm, I'm looking at the lattice work and everything else, I notice a little door and I wanted to kind of look in to see how far that slab went back. I open the door and there is about 50 of these metal fence tops underneath the porch. <laughs> what? Were they damaged? No. Oh boy. <laughs> Oops. So I don't say anything. Okay. I take a picture 
you know, what's there. And I just take a quick, I mean, I didn't have time to count them because I just don't want this confrontation because these people were a little out there, right? you know? And so about the time I close that little lattice door, the wife, the wife comes around the corner. She goes, oh, what is it that you're needing under there? <laughs> you know? And I said, well, you talk about the damage to the porch. I'm just trying to get a look at what's underneath there and everything. And she goes, well, what'd you see? I said, tops of the fence post. <laughs> <laughs> she goes, excuse me? I said, yes, ma'am. I said, they're all underneath your porch Did you know there. that? And she goes, well, how'd they get there? I said, well, I don't know. I, maybe your dog took off with them, was hiding them, <laughs> you know, or something. I don't, I'm not sure how they got there, but we don't have to worry about that. She goes, well, I'll let my husband know. <laughs> that was it, man. It got out of there. Well, I leave, you know, I take care of everything. About three hours later, get a phone call from the husband. Uh, no, those are the old ones we used to have. Uh, we don't use those anymore. Uh, we, we replace them all with different ones. You know, so those are, those are not the ones that we use. They're, we use something completely different. I said, well, you know, they just so happened to match the two that were still on the fence post that you left out as examples. And I said it that way. And that's not the way I meant to say it. You know, and immediately accused me of calling him a th dishonest and a liar mm -hmm. and everything else. And I said, sir, I said, what I meant to say was, is that the two that were on the fence post that you showed me as examples are exactly like the ones that are underneath the house. Okay. I can come back out and we can compare those. Okay. And see if they're any different. But from what I saw, they were exactly the same. He goes, come on out. So uh -huh. I show back up out there and guess what? The two that were on the fence post were missing. Uh huh. However, I had photos of them and we matched up. And so they didn't get their money for that. And Last I heard, they were still trying to argue it. Fence post caps. Fence post caps. There was 30-something of them, okay? So 30-something hey, right. times 40 apiece, you yeah. know, that's, I mean, that's, that's money. That, that helps them with their deductible. It does. It does, absolutely. You know, so that's what we had there. Are you ready for bad, dad joke bad time. bingo kino? So... Pick one, anyone. Oh, well, that's a great one. Why do you never see elephants hiding in trees? Why do you never see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 